A lovely 10 to 12 knots northeasterly breeze made for an exciting start to the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club's Rolex China Sea Race 2024. All 21 boats got off to a clean start at 11.20 hours in the stunning Hong Kong Victoria Harbour. The fleet gathered before the start at Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club's Kellett Island Clubhouse for a lion dance to wish the competitors a safe journey across the ever-challenging South China Sea. Dynamic, diverse, and most definitely distinct. Here it comes now, heading pressure. Here we go, stand by. The Rolex China Sea Race starts from Hong Kong's imposing Victoria Harbour on Wednesday the 27th of March. Getting out of the harbour is always very tactical. There's lots of tacks, lots of boats, sometimes there's other vessels, container ships coming through the harbour. Organised by the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club, the race is Asia's premier offshore yachting event and attracts a top-class international fleet. You start in the city. One hour later, you're out at sea. Good luck. First held in 1962, the 565 nautical mile race follows the ancient trade routes through the unpredictable open waters of the South China Sea, before transitioning into the Luzon coast and entering the pristine waters of Subic Bay in the Philippines for the finish. Lovely way to watch the sunrise. Overcoming the constantly shifting weather patterns, plus challenging overnight conditions, places a premium on tactics, tenacity, and teamwork. I tell the guys you're fighting in the trenches, and I'd like them to fight in the trenches the entire way to Subic. Returning for this unique test of seamanship is 2023 overall winner, Nick Southard's Whiskey Jack. Yeah! and Ernesto Echao's Standard Insurance Centennial 5 will also be back, having last year become the first ever Philippines entry to take line honours. We're so happy that we were given the opportunity to be able to express ourselves. Thank you. It's just one of the most sensational sailing experiences, I think. The Rolex China Sea Race, the jewel of blue water racing in Asia. This is your weekly Global Sailing Highlights show, The World on Water, April 5th, 2024. The popular sailing podcast, Sailing Illustrated, is always covering the latest in sailing, and this week had the mail on the New York Yacht Club's Big America's Cup yacht, and its delivery from the US to Barcelona, via the big Ukrainian heavy lift Antonov cargo plane. The boats are assembling in Barcelona as Ineos Britannia's AB3 boat is also in transit down the A35 from Carrington Boats, not quite the entry as made by the Americans. Speaking of Claire Harrington, her uh, New York Yacht Club made some news over the weekend by flying their boat from Providence, their new boat, their AC75 from Providence to Barcelona. And of course, we have the images, we have the video thanks to several of our FOSI, notably Stingray, but mm -hmm. on Sunday at PVD, which is TF Green International Airport in Providence, Rhode Island, an Antonov, not the big enchil, not the huge Antonov 225, but that was destroyed in the war. Uh, this is an Antonov 124, of which several of them still exist. They got them out of Ukraine before the war, or they were on, they were doing business. They were already out of Ukraine before the war started. And here it is at TF, one of them, at TF Green on Sunday. And people thought they were so surprised. And I posted this picture on my Facebook page uh, as my cover photo. And I was accused of posting one from the last cup. And I wouldn't do that. You and could. here, well, I could, but I wouldn't. Yeah. And here is another. None of you has this. Corey Welch on TikTok sent this, the plane taking off from PVD. If you ever needed to see one of these huge planes, we had them flying America's Cup boats around back in 90, 
two? Not the first time somebody flew a boat? Maybe before that. But the Antonovs were used, I know for sure, in the San Diego Cup. And that, uh, courtesy of Corey Welsh from TikTok, then this was the flight pass. Stingray sent this to me. And he has one of these sites that, like you do, Julia, you following the ships around, the AIS and so on. What's that called? Marine, that you follow the ships? Marine traffic yeah. something? Yeah. Well, Stingray has great resources and great Googling skills. And he followed the plane from, because we weren't sure, but uh, there it was. There was the flight pad. Did not stop. Did not stop up uh, in Canada. Flew nonstop to Barcelona on Sunday the 24th. Followed, tracked the flight. Now this plane number, the tail number was UR for Ukraine, 82008, Providence to Barcelona. And for the avoidance of doubt, there is the biggie. There is the Antonov 225. This is a photo from 1989 at the Paris Air Show. Oh, yeah. When it flew in and out with the the Soviet version. Were they the Soviets then or were they the Russians? Then? But anyway, that's the Barada. Is that what it was called? The Barada, their, their orbiter, like our, um, what was ours called? I don't remember. Before it, it, it blew up and, you know, uh, but let me let me go back. So that that was the big plane, and that plane had six Ukrainian-made engines, fully six high-powered engines. Look at all the tires on that baby. Oh yeah, this is what it looked like, and it co would cover a football field. It was three hundred plus feet, three hundred meters long, give or take, and it had twin six-story tail fins. Ooh. And it met its demise in the early days of the war on the 2nd of April, 2022, so two years ago. Oh, it was called bad. Mariah. They, they anglicized the name. They called it Mariah and spelled it, um, I guess, differently. Destroyed in the Russia-Ukraine war in April of 2022. But wait, there's more, because we have the video that the team released just before we went to air today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, I told you it was brief. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was not 300 meters long. It was 100 meters long, 300 feet foot football field length. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve Gruber. It was not 300 meters long. My graphics department screwed that up. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been April Fool's Day, but the weather in Palma de Mallorca was no joke. Sailors faced steep, mountainous waves and 20 to 30 knot winds for the opening day of the Trofeo Princesa Sofia, keeping the IQ foil men and women, 49er, 49er FX, and NACRA 17 fleets from racing. The women's kite, 470, and Ilka 6 and 7 fleets, were able to get races off despite a challenging day. With gusts to over 30 knots at times and a big, untidy swell, which has been built up by nearly two weeks of strong winds in the Balearica Islands, of the 10 Olympic scheduled events only the Formula Kite men and women, the Ilka 6 and Ilka 7 single-handers and the redoubtable 470 mixed were actually able to race and open their accounts on schedule at the 53, Trofeo Princesa Sofia, Mallorca, by Ibro Star. It was nuclear today and we were loving it. We don't get many opportunities to race in these conditions. Conditions were extreme but saleable, according to Denmark's Ilka 6 Olympic champion Anne-Marie Rindem, who was just one of the many athletes who enjoyed the big breeze, big surf challenge of opening day. Another was USA's five times Formula Kite world champion, Daniela Moros, who won the event on its debut at the Princesa Sofia in 2022. She proved untouchable in the breeze, and along with Germany's Philipp Bull, in the Ilka 7 they are the only two athletes making a perfect, unbeaten start. More rows. Loving it, Marta, mostly smoothly. It was nuclear today, and I was loving it. 
we don't get many opportunities to race in these conditions, so I am always excited for days like this, because I always learn and improve a lot. It was pretty hectic out there, and really, I was just happy to just get around the course and finish both races relatively clean. Enthused Moros who leads Briania Whitehead, who will be Australia's representative when the foiling kite class makes its Olympic debut this summer. With the men's kite event completing three heats of their planned four, Pan American Games champion, Bruno Lobo of Brazil, leads Singapore's world champion Max Marta, last year's winner overall. Lobo went 1, 1, 2 in the blue fleet whilst Marta, in the yellow fleet, went 3, 1, 1. The conditions were crazy today, the waves were really big and so it was all about surviving with your equipment intact, at least for me it was. Race 1 was interesting as I was leading at the first mark and it went smoothly until the last downwind where my kite collapsed because of the wind and I ended up crashing because of that. After I recovered I was third. In the second and third races it went smoothly with no issues and so definitely feel ready for whatever is to come. Reported Marta. Australia's world and Olympic champion Matt Wern started his Sofia title challenge with a first and a third, to lie fourth behind Bull, GBR's Mickey Beckett, winner here twice in a row, W and Norway's Hermann Tomasgardel, who was runner-up to Wern at the Worlds in Adelaide in January. I guess that is my best start for a few years here. Acknowledged Wern it was quite brisk, a one and a three for the day is a good start. It was not easy. In this really big fleet getting off the start line with speed in the big waves was the key because then you could use your boat speed, that was half the job. Denmark's Rindum is on great form as she builds up to her gold medal defense. It was windy, especially in the second race we saw over 30 knots and big waves. Winds are forecast to be lighter for the second day Tuesday with an expectation that rising temperatures will see an embat sea breeze regime established around 8 to 12 knots from around midday. The North Pacific Ocean. The Big One. The ultimate test of physical and mental fortitude, our intrepid race crew, are set to face. On previous editions, teams have encountered mountainous waves as tall as 14 meters, in sea states classed as phenomenal. Hurricane force winds, freezing temperatures, and a true sense of remoteness are all a possibility, but that is what the teams train for. Every crew member has undergone intensive and rigorous training and are led on the race by an experienced skipper and first mate. The Almighty. The almighty North Pacific is just the brutal, more challenging ocean in the world. The North Pacific, for me, it can be the most beautiful place on the planet, and it can be the most terrifying place on the planet. What makes it tough is that it's long. We're going to encounter heavy winds and heavy seas, and it's cold. And if I have to use one word for it, it's relentless. It's desolate, it's cold, it's wet, it's windy, there's big seas. There's... It's phenomenal. Um, there's nowhere else like it. Everyone knows that this is quite a big, serious thing. But that's part of the reason it draws people, it's because it is, a, it is a, a serious challenge. It's an amazing place, but it's relentless and it's harsh.
Here's a look into the Italian Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli America's Cup team. What I really like is the competition, comparing yourself with others and trying to bring out your best. Rugero Tita is channeling precision, decisiveness, and a quest for the extreme into conquering the 2024 America's Cup. I am always, maybe per fortuna, maybe per forza di volontà, e riuscito a raggiungere i miei obiettivi. Ho una giornata memorabile perché Ruggero Titta entra nella storia. Il primo grande obiettivo è stato quello di arrivare alle Olimpiadi, di poter essere un atleta lì. Ruggero Titta, una regata controllata. Raggiunto quello, l'obiettivo si è ingrandito, è stato quello di vincere l'oro alle Olimpiadi. In qualche modo ce l'ho fatta. E dopo quello l'obiettivo è di vincere la Coppa America. Sono Ruggero Tita, numero 26, timoniere per Luna Rossa. La mia passione per avere la scopo in un laghetto del Trentino, in mezzo alle montagne. Lì parte la mia avventura nel, nella vela agonistica. Una tappa importante è stata la vittoria del, del mio primo campionato italiano e da lì realizzo che, che mi piacerebbe eh, fare della vela il, il mio lavoro. Ovviamente da lì, per 13 anni un ragazzino, eh, quello che può fare è soltanto impegnarsi e cercare di, di, di andare sempre più forte. Ce la faccio a qualificarmi per, per Tokyo 2020, che poi sarà nel, nel 2021, e eh, riuscire poi a vincere la medaglia d'oro nel, nel NACRA 17. Primo Trentino vince un oro ai giochi estivi insieme a Caterina Banti nel NACRA 17 e riporta alla vela italiana una medaglia attesa da 20 anni. Grande. Eravamo al Festival dello Sport a Trento nel 2018, la mia, la mia città natale. A un certo punto, verso la metà del, dello spettacolo, Max eh, mi chiama sul palco e, e annuncia con mia totale sorpresa e con grande sorpresa anche di, di tutto il pubblico eh, che sarei stato membro del team. Il fatto di splittare il mio tempo in due, con, con due obiettivi così diversi ovviamente non è, non è per niente facile, però io penso che, che sia possibile. Alla fine la vela è sempre vela e, e gli allenamenti dell'ACRA spesso aiutano Luna Rossa e uguale, Luna Rossa aiuta la, la campagna olimpica. Il perfezionismo è spesso una cosa pericolosa, eh, ma è una delle mie caratteristiche, nel senso che eh, cerco e anzi ho bisogno che la mia barca, il mio mezzo sia al 100%, devo essere sicuro e convinto di aver controllato tutto prima di cominciare una gara o un allenamento. Essere estremo anche quella è una parte abbastanza pericolosa. <ride> Le barche stanno andando sempre più in una direzione di, di estremo. Questo è un po' quello che alleno nei miei, nei miei sport estremi, eh, uscire dalla zona di comfort per poi eh, essere più abituati a, a, a prendere decisioni e le decisioni giuste al momento giusto. Quello che, che mi piace è proprio la competizione, il, la parte agonistica e la parte di e mettersi a confronto con gli altri e cercare di tirare fuori il meglio. Perché secondo me noi dobbiamo cercare di essere meglio delle generazioni passate, quindi solo così potremo cercare di andare avanti e di, di vincere sempre di più. The Royal Ocean Racing Club has big plans to promote youth sailing in 2024. Over the years, through the generosity of ROC members, the Griffin Fund has assisted in providing race boats and experienced sailors to improve young sailors' understanding of offshore racing. An exciting evolution has started with quite a bang for 2024. Nearly 300 sailors, 18 to 30 years of age, contacted the ROC with 200 attending a Griffin Zoom webinar held by the Griffin project team. Offshore racing is all about a whale oil machine, and it's all the working parts that have to come together. Who 
Global Trans Living Griffin is give an opportunity for people between 18 and 30 to get involved in offshore sailing. It's not an easy sport to get involved in. Um, you've got to find a crew, a boat, a skipper. Um, and what we're trying to do is to remove some of those barriers. It's Griffin Selection Weekend. You know, we've spent a good amount of time you know, doing lots of drills. It's been excellent, if tiring at times. But Ultimately, they're pressure tested here. They are kept up late at night. They're doing lots of different challenges to put them under pressure. This is a selection weekend. The people that are going to stand out are the people that are giving it their all. One of the real challenges in Griffin is being able to take 40 individual sailors and find 20 people we can make five teams. So lots of what we've been doing in the last three days has been identifying characters who actually will be part of a team. Everyone's got strengths and weaknesses. We're trying to find all those parts where one and one makes three. So at this stage, we're not necessarily looking for sailors that can win offshore races. We're going to coach them that. We're going to look for people that can come together as a team, the people that are going to absorb the coaching and ultimately learn together via a performance team. If we've been physically tired, mentally tired, working as a team, but it's still really important to get stuck in. It doesn't matter how good you are at sailing if you got the wrong attitude. So attitude, I would say, is really important on the boat because one person's morale can completely change the mood of the entire boat. Uh, so I think bringing a really positive attitude, um, even when the results may not be what you're expecting, can still help improve how you're sailing and your performance on the day. From a selector's point of view, if you can see those people putting in the effort working hard and wanting to get through it. They're the people that shine and stand out. It's a long time I've been sailing. I've been open-minded and listened and learned from the people around me. So being able to share that knowledge with the up and coming generation of sailors is, I feel proud to be able to do it. And it's it, the, big, the major goal is to share knowledge. We, we've designed the selection trials so that the sailors that uh, do not get through to the squad this year take away uh, some good learnings. This is not just us taking, we want to give as well. And that's really key. So personal development, how they communicate to people, how they interact as part of a team. We spent a lot of time last night and this morning talking about some very specific skills. So how do you set up a rig? How do you maintain a diesel engine? How do you check the the regulations for going on a walk race, skills they can take onto other boats, other campaigns. You know, off the flight from the US and I'm on a ferry with a bunch of people I don't know. Um, and instantly off the bat, everybody's introducing themselves and getting to know each other. But through all these exercises, it was really cool to watch, you know, all the teams come together and all the people kind of fit their strengths and like learn when to step back, how to work together, and like the big thing was like communication. It's been all about resilience because you've got to be willing to get stuck into everything and really learn from everyone around you. Well, I didn't realise how much nuance there was. There's so much that can be gained by doing loads of small, challenging activities with a new group of people. But somebody like this, well, John on the selection team here was brilliant for coaching us, making us a little bit better at doing all the small things. And hopefully we can take it to the race course. So it's been difficult, but like nothing that is worthwhile is easy. Yeah, we want people who really want this. You know, what we're offering is, I think, fairly unique today. The opportunity to have a sailor-led campaign. So five sailors were given a boat for three races. They were raced about 1,200 miles without any coach on board, without an owner on board, able to make their own mistakes, their own decisions. And that is a real privilege. So we want people who are going to commit to this who are going to not only come along and do three days of fairly hard selection, and no one likes doing selection, let's face it, it's pretty miserable, um, but then turn up on the Thursday night, get their boats ready, just like an owner would, go sailing, at the end of the sailing, pack the boat away. So we want these, these sailors to own those boats. It's their campaign, it's their boat. It's really important to me that they want to be here and not just here for the, the prize. Few yachts are more iconic than Penn Duick 6, with its long and colourful history with the Whitbread round-the-world race.
designed specifically for the 1973 Whitbread, and sailed by the legendary Eric Tabarly, Penn Duick 6, had to be built in record time to make it to the starting line. She was an unofficial entrant in the 1977-78 Whitbread, and in 1981-82 as Euromark. Marie Tabarly, is now owner and skipper of the 73 feet, 33 ton Penn Duick 6, the flagship of the Elliman, Terra project, raising public awareness of major environmental and social issues. Semaine 4. <laughs> Semaine 4 et le dernier anticyclone de notre tour du monde des anticyclones. Ah bah j'espère. Inch'Allah. On a eu, euh, je sais pas, une vingtaine d'anticyclones. On a eu en tout cas beaucoup plus d'anticyclones que de dépressions sur ce tour du monde. Nous sommes sortis du poteau noir il y a une semaine. On s'est fait une semaine de près. On sort du poteau noir avec euh, à peu près 180 000 d'avance euh, sur Spirit of Helsinki. Et euh, bah là, on a très très bien marché. On a eu euh, des très belles journées au près où on fait des moyennes à 9 nœuds 5, 10 nœuds. Euh, et euh, 10 nœuds au près, c'est euh, quand même très appréciable. <rire> Donc c'est bien régalé et le bateau marchait très très bien. Et les journées auprès à 240 000, c'est des très bonnes journées. Hein. On recommence à avoir une avance confortable sur Spirit of Helsinki à à peu près 240 000. Peu... On recommence à arriver dans le monde des poissons volants, il continue à faire chaud mais une température beaucoup plus agréable et beaucoup plus acceptable. Il commence limite à faire même un peu froid pendant la nuit donc c'est euh, même très appréciable. La grande différence par rapport à la semaine dernière, c'est que maintenant on reçoit des weather facts qui sont très intéressants. Parce qu'on reçoit les weather facts de Boston, on reçoit ceux de la Nouvelle Orléans, on reçoit ceux de l'Angleterre et ceux de l'Allemagne. Donc le weather facts tourne à plein régime. <rire> Donc c'est des cartes qui sont encore assez grossières hein, comparées au, à la technologie qu'on peut avoir à terre. Mais euh, c'est amplement suffisant pour avoir une météo euh, où on sait où on doit aller et se positionner par rapport à un système. Ça maintenant c'est très appréciable. Et la chose où il faut faire très attention maintenant, c'est que ça fait six mois qu'on était dans l'hémisphère sud. À avoir des dépressions qui tournaient dans le sens horaire et les anticyclones qui tournaient dans le sens anti-horaire. Maintenant, on a rebasculé en hémisphère nord. Du coup, on a les anticyclones qui tournent en sens horaire et les, anti et les dépressions qui, sont, qui tournent dans le sens anti-horaire. Et ça, Minda, c'est une gymnastique à laquelle il faut faire vraiment attention. Quoi. On vient de vivre 24 heures un peu difficile avec un gros coup d'arrêt. Quand on est rentré dans l'anticyclone des Açores, l'anticyclone des Açores prend, couvre en ce moment tout l'Atlantique euh, par euh, des États-Unis jusqu'au Maroc. Donc euh, ça fait un peu muraille de Chine. Donc, évidemment, on est rentré dedans avant les autres. Donc les autres sont encore revenus. Donc, on a encore perdu un peu de notre avance. La bonne nouvelle, c'est que bah, eux, ils y sont toujours et que nous, on recommence par contre à galoper. Et maintenant, euh, on est sous spi, sous, sous runner. Enfin, L'objectif des trois prochaines journées, c'est d'arriver à toucher l'air euh, de la prochaine dépression qui va nous catapulter sur les Açores et de toucher l'air avant les autres et pouvoir décoller avant les autres. Bon, ça, on verra euh, la semaine prochaine. <rire>